One little mistake made by a teacher led to the death of the whole school. Or to be more precise, zombification. He conducted experiments on mice in order to save his son. But as expected, both son and mouse broke free and began the zombie apocalypse. Hi, I'm Ali. I'm a real scientist and a huge sci-fi lover. Today, we're going to find out if the zombie virus is real. The story of the new series from Netflix is new and incredibly resembles The Faculty, classic movie by Robert Rodriguez. Only now, the aliens have been replaced by zombies. But something else is interesting here. The zombie apocalypse is shown as exactly the same pandemic what we are living in right now. And if coronavirus didn't scare you enough, then let me add some fuel to the fire. The existence of the zombie virus is quite real, and I have a ready-made scheme for its creation. So watch this video until the very end. The director of the series All of Us Are Dead realized one simple but ingenious thing. Rats are a great source for the infectional spread and mutation of any kind. There are a lot of them, they are widespread, rapidly procreating and quite immune resistant to viruses. So they live a completely healthy lifestyle being only carriers. Of course, the screenwriters push the plot a little. They tell the story of the brilliant teacher and his insane experiment in school laboratory. Unfortunately or fortunately, this is not how it works. But first of all, let's figure out who the zombies are. Once upon a time in Haiti, local shamans performed magical rituals. They dragged people into slavery. And even sometimes they did it as a punishment for especially dangerous criminals. By the way, now the creation of zombies is officially prohibited by Haitian law. Of course, it all sounds like one little horror story which we tell each other around the campfire. But the thing is, the process has completely scientific meaning. Anthropological research by anthropotanist Wade Davis has shown that the process of creating zombies in Haiti is largely based on principle of neuroscience. He suggested that Woody practice rely on two very interesting neuropharmacological substances, tetradotoxin and datura. Tetradotoxin is a neurotoxin which is produced in the body of many animals, like blowfish. It disables all systems which allow neurons to communicate. Voodoo sorcerers use this property of poison to simulate death, causing almost fatal paralysis. So neurons are not able to communicate and our consciousness is extremely vulnerable. And here the datura comes into action. It causes delirium in victims and makes them obedient due to strong hallucinogenic substances. Datura leaves victim in their older state of mind, which makes them easily suggestible. And after this process, voila, we made a zombie. Of course, creating one zombie after another will be a very long and insufficient process. That's why we have to pay attention to two very important ideas. First of all, we have to separate neurons to make brain less conscious, leave it just some primary functions. And second, someone or something have to inspire the victim which these functions will serve for. And if such a virus exists or someone will create it, then its purpose is simple from their natural selection point of view. The goal is to reproduce. That's why zombies are always trying to bite all the living around, not because they like the taste of the fresh flesh or brains. Seriously, where did it come from? But because the most reliable way to spread the virus is into the blood, they are simply trying to reproduce and force their host victims to infect other living objects. By the way, for this video, I read several chapters of the book Survival Among Zombies by Max Brooks. He 
he was the person who created the concept of the movie World War Z. And he doesn't exclude the sexual method of infection here. Just imagine. My hypothesis about the virus obsession of the nervous system also has some support. The surest way to kill a zombie is to put the bullet in his head, or simply cut it off. To disconnect the brain with the rest of the body. But let's go back to our teacher and his experiments. He tried to make the rat more aggressive by increasing the production of adrenaline through DNA mutations. Let's ignore that such experiment cannot be carried out in the school laboratory, but where did a virus come from? It's very simple. It was really lived in a rat and mutated along with rat's own DNA. Do you know, for example, that 99% of living beings on the planet are viruses and bacteria? And we don't know even a thousandth part of the existing viruses hidden in the thickness of the glacier or quietly living in the body of some little bat in the jungles of Amazonia or Asia. So what if I will tell you that the virus with similar specification already exists? One word, rabies. This infection kept humanity in fear for thousands of years, until quite recently a person bitten by a sick animal was considered doomed. For people prefer to commit suicide before they lose their mind. The rabies virus uses the blood-brain barrier. It is a structure that separates brain tissue from blood. The virus destroys the nervous tissue of the brain, killing its owner. Just like shamans who do the same with neurotoxins, and cinematographic zombie virus would damage the frontal lobe of the brain. The similarities don't end there. Firstly, both zombies and rabies victims are afraid of water. Secondly, they both show an extreme level of aggression. And thirdly, both viruses use the mechanism of transmission of the virus into the blood with the help of a bite. Here I should notice one fairy fact. Sometimes infected animals do not show aggression. On the contrary, their behavior is very different from how a wild animal should behave. For example, wild foxes stop being afraid of humans. They invade town and villages and attack when you expect it at least. This actually also indicates that the brain has retained only primary functions and completely forgot about the instincts of preservation. It functions only on the feeling of hunger, or in the case of the virus, the thirst for reproduction. The only serious difference is the incubation period. 24 hours is enough to become a zombie, while rabies requires up to 6 months. But this is quite feasible genetic engineering task for a Korean teacher, isn't it? By the way, there is a curious fact that not only viruses can turn other living organisms into a zombie. In nature, there is a parasitic fungus that forces ants to carry out its orders. We are talking about a parasite called Orphiocordyceps unilateralis. Usually, the spores of this parasite fungus get on the body of an ant and germinate inside its body. The whole process is accompanied by release of certain substances of the alkaloid group into the ant's body, which make the ant forget about its need and completely submit to the parasite. Ants affected by this fungus leave the ant hill and begin to wander alone. The main goal of the fungus is to get to the best place where it could continue to grow. Since this parasite is very picky, the ant needs to find a place where the temperature and humidity are ideal. That a suitable place for a parasite is found, the ant dies and a mushroom grows out of its head, forming a box with spores. So in the end, let's make some conclusions. For creating a zombie virus, you will need rabies for neuron destruction and aggressive behavior and the fungus to submit the host. 
symbiosis to be shaken, not stirred. For some reason, we always forget that from a physical point of view, zombie apocalypses cannot last forever. Sooner or later, all bodies will decompose completely, even if we assume that a virus somehow slows down the process. Therefore, the plausibility of the 11 seasons of The Walking Dead is extremely doubtful. The case is likely to end according to the plot of the Stephen King's novel Stand, then 99% of humanity simply died out. That's why I do not recommend you to conduct inappropriate experiments, because instead of post-apocalyptic zombie killing fun, we will be waiting for era without amenities, dentistry, YouTube, and your favorite pizzeria around the corner. And although the probability of creation of such a virus is not very high, but it's never a zero. And if we take into account the countless amount of viruses lurking into the wild, it's better to be worried about what nature can bring us in the future, what kind of pandemics. But we will talk about this next time. Live long and prosper, my friend.